Welcome to the exclusive interview of top Nigerian comedian Godons. Ladies and gentlemen, there's always a first time in everything. The first time when I drink a hop, four bottles of Buddha for a Mebira, Nasa Waka like crap. Everybody had that boy. Oh boy. Trust me here. I reached my papa. See my papa they call for my drinking eye and my landlord. If you see slap, call my papa face. What was growing up like? When you talk about uh, grow up, I would like to start from the very beginning. Uh, I was born in Ondo State in a place called Ubuenye or something like that. When I was born, something mysterious happened. I was born with seven feet in my mouth. I don't know how it happened, but that, that's how the story goes. And so, because they haven't seen such in, in that locality, they felt it was a taboo or uh, maybe the gods was angry with them or something. And so they conspired, they wanted to take my life because my own parents were ashamed to have seen a child born with feet in his mouth. So they actually came together and said they should take my life. Just when I was being fed, the agreement was that maybe they could hold on to my nostrils and then look for a way to suffocate me to make sure uh, I don't see the light of day. Uh, my own mother, by her own effort, she broke four out of the seven. So it was just remaining three. Because out of the heart of the mother, she just wanted to know if, if they happened to see only three, they might just want to leave me alone. You know, so the day actually came that they had made the plan. And but God, who will not leave us alone nor forsake us, sent someone to rescue me. The man came, his name is Ajife. He came and said, uh, What is this thing that I hear? Uh, I was told that someone was born to this family. How come you people are making plans to also eliminate him? So they explained. The story, and of course, opened my mouth and they discovered that I had teeth in my mouth. As a child, I was just two days old, you know. So uh, the man said, This cannot happen in his presence. That a child that is marked like this from heaven might just be a king. In fact, as a matter of fact, in a dossier, this is the kind of children they use to as kings, you know. So that man actually gave me the name Oba. And then uh, he was one watching over me. He ensures that he comes to see me noon and money, just to be sure I was safe. You know, it came to a point, he was the one campaigning to everybody that this is the plan that they should leave me alone. And that was how God saved me from the beginning. You know, and then uh, not long after that, just when I was about to be three months old, my mom and my dad separated. The reason of the separation, I can't tell you, but they separated. My dad went his own way and my mom went her way. And then uh, I wasn't given to suck. I was just left alone like that. I almost became crippled. Uh, it was hard growing up as a child. I had to learn everything by myself. My parents were not there for me. I wasn't given any parental love. Nobody was there to direct me, to teach me that this is the way to go. You know, so I grew up learning everything all by myself. At, at some point, I never, I never knew there was a mother. I thought my grandmother who raised me was the only mom I had. You know, when I was about 13, they got me circumcised. Life, there was no anesthetics or anything to kill pain or to knock me out like that. As a teenager, I was circumcised like that. I felt the pain of the knife just as it should be. And uh, I bled almost went again. So my growing up was horrible. When I was 14, 15, I saw my mother for the first time. And even when I saw her, she didn't want to see me because she felt, okay, maybe because I've grown up in the village, uh, maybe I have been given witchcraft or something. So she didn't want to see me. She was avoiding me totally. You know, so I grew up being deprived of parental love. I, I was thrown to the street. But thank God I didn't go the way of the street. I knew God early uh, because since I could not find love anywhere, the only love I could find was the love of God. 
And that has kept me and that has helped me to this day. So that was my growing up. And uh, even my father gave birth to like 15, 16 children and I happened to be the first. And when I was tired of staying with my mother because I was almost becoming a little trade, I couldn't go to school just because my mom was never there for me. I had to like make up my mind because my mates were coming from school and they would rain curses and insult on me. And I was grown, but I just could not express myself in any ways. Simply because I was afraid to go to my father because my grandmother had painted a picture that my father is a soldier that if I should go close to my father, he could shoot me. So as a child, I was traumatized. When I see my father coming, I'll run because I felt maybe he was going to shoot me or something. You know, so but there was a day after much insult from my parents and I just could not take it. I felt the only way that I could go to school, at least have a level of education, was to go to my father's house that I feared so much. And when I got there, my father did not accept me, neither did his, his wife, or my stepmother rather. You know how stepmothers do. They don't want to see another child to come into their matrimony. And then somehow by prayers and by tenacity, I was allowed to stay in the house. And then I started going through another torture through the hands of my stepmother. There's nothing I didn't see when I was in that house. My dad had gone to work and you know, even when there's food in the house, they wouldn't just give me food because they felt I was an outcast, I was an outsider. So from a child, I was stigmatized. I grew up with high, low self-esteem, let me put it that way. You know, I, I don't mix with people, I don't mingle with people. And then because my parents were poor, uh, I was going to school barefooted. In secondary school, I was going to secondary school barefooted. My secondary school then was like from this studio down to uh, Akoka. I would trek down barefooted like that. And I remember there was a day I was going to school. Somebody saw me, his name is Olua Logbo. A son to one of the pastors in Celestia Church of Christ. He called me and said, how could you be going to secondary school barefooted? And I said, I don't have any footwear. He said, what about bathroom slippers? I said, I don't have. And he couldn't believe it. We were that poor. And then um, he gave me one of his third hand sanders. When I mean third hand, you know, sometimes when, they are, when the desirable is unavailable, available becomes desirable. No, that sanders has been used by generations. And then I'm sure that Sanders saw a lot of fourth world war, including fifth world war. It was totally out. But that was my joy. Dan Sanders was everything to me. Dan Sanders was my outing shoe, was my school shoe, was everything, trust me. And then there was a day I went to school and I was running from assembly just because there was a rush and there was a push at the gate. Someone stepped on that sander and the sander got torn. Man, I cried like I lost a father. I wept so like the whole world came crumbling down because of that sander, because that was my all, all right? And then when I noticed that I've gone back to trekking barefooted, I had to wake up one day and look for a way to make money, all right? And then I, I, I was now almost like 19, 20. I was, you know, beginning to have a feeling for a partner, you know, but I just could not go to a girl or say something. Even, even though in my class I was brilliant, I was always number one. In Nana College, you can ask and ask, let them give you my record. I was always, because when you don't have nowhere else to turn other than God and your book, you have to do well. My brain was just divided into two then. God and book, because after that nothingness, I don't go out, I don't play, you know. So that was how I grew up. And then my parents were not there, so but I got to do what I got to do. That's why I say to people, you don't have any reason to fail. I have been subjected to the worst situations in life, but today God has brought me thus far. And so this, this is my growing up. It was hell. I can't tell you all because we won't have time for it. So that's just how I grew up. It's just a little bit of the iceberg of how I grew up. When you went to Las Vegas, can you not carry a car? That is a DB. It's what? Like the badge bring the GTB car. 
How did comedy start for you? You must understand that there are two categories of comedians. There are comedians who learned the act because they felt, okay, Basket Mart is driving a good car, Bovi is driving a good car, AYs and the Godons and all those people are driving a good car. Maybe if I do what they do, I should be able to be like them. And so there are people who learned the art, you know, of comedy. And then there are some of the there's another group that is called the naturally talented comedian, right? I remember when I was growing with my parents, when I was with my father, when vis visitors come to our house, they would call me to come and entertain them. And then I would go and crack joke, and they would be laughing, this boy is funny. They would give me money, buy things for me. I like that. So I was being used as an entertainer. And then when I got to secondary school, I was elected as a head boy. Before I would address assembly that money, I would have cracked like two, three, four jokes and make every. So I was, I was the toast of the society in my school. Everybody wants to come to assembly because they know head boy will address us and we're all going to laugh. So even when there was no money to pay school fees, my teachers, they would raise money and pay my fees. And then when I got to the university, I was very much involved in evangelism. So I, would, I was part of Scripture Union. So I, part of my evangelistic uh, strategy was to crack joke. I go on stage and uh, before I say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? I may have cracked one or two things and that will get the attention. And I begin to tell them the gospel. You know, so I never knew that what I was doing was capable of putting bread on my table. But I was just doing it for the love of it. You know, I, I was just enjoying doing comedy among my friends, in school, in churches, just like that. And then in 2005, I came to Lagos. I came basically to do music. And I had done the music, finished the album, and I was ready to release. And then I was in a group there called DCM Voice, and we needed to go to Night of a Thousand Laughs in uh, Abuja to do a show. And when we got there, the owner of Night of a Thousand Love, Upper Williams, said, before you guys sing, you should do like 15-minute comedy. I said, really? He said, because I've been listening to your songs and you're funny. So I went on stage. 15 minutes, he went to 30. 30, he went to 35. 35, he went to 40. And before I know, the whole one hour, I was dishing out comedy. And after that, there was absolutely no need for us to sing. But because I had come with the brother, I still have to sing. We sang, and that was the journey. And then when I came back to Lagos that day, I met Basketman on the Korodu Expressway. And he said, hey, I'm doing my laughing jams in Fantasyland. I want you to come over. I went. And that day, when the comedy was set, Generator packed up, Nepa went. And everybody, we were in darkness. And yet the place was packed. And Basket was trying to run everywhere just to make sure there's light so that the show can go on. Man, I went on stage like that. Because when you are hungry for it, you're hungry for it. I went on stage like that. You will not believe it. One hour, uh, 20 minutes, I, went on, I was on stage, no microphone, no light. That big hall, I was just projecting. And guess what? Laughter was raging like a tsunami. And Basket, Basket was wondering, what's going on? Is anybody playing a CD or something? So they told him, no, there's one guy there's one guy who is not just himself right now. And then when he came, he saw me do stuff. He just folded his hand and he was looking at me. And I was doing my thing. Finally, Nepa brought light. And the whole crowd said, please take the light. We don't need the light anymore. And that was how it all started. From there, Basket said, I'm going to be hosting the show every Wednesday. And I hosted that show for like 10 times. And then I went to experience, performed in front of 250,000, the second one 500,000, and on and on and on. And ladies and gentlemen, before I knew it, instead of music, I'm, I'm doing comedy. That's how far I've come. My father may not be a very rich man, but he was disciplined. My papa would beat my head for the class of the evacuation. Because I said, I'm just coming. How 
How would you rate the comedy industry in Nigeria today? For me, we, we've grown. We've grown remarkably uh, because when you have an industry that is able to provide jobs for young people like we have in our country, I think it's worth celebrating. Uh, we've come a very, very long way. and the, the industry has been developed to a point where hey, anybody who comes in now, you face a lot of challenges in order for you to sell. Um, even though we're not the best uh, of industry yet, we're not where we should be as a people yet. Uh, because we are still yet to have a governing body that will regulate the activities of comedians. And so it is just a question of everybody doing his thing to make his own money. But nevertheless, uh, I think in the comedy industry now, we have some more creative people than it used to be. You know that it was just Alibaba, Basket Man, the, the Bosaj, okay, Bakasi, the Julius the Juniors, Agu, and all of these people. But these days, you have some young boys just come from nowhere, and we crack everybody up. And so, in terms of creativity, yeah, I think we've gone up a little bit. And uh, in terms of presentation, yeah, and in terms of packaging, we're doing fantastically well. Uh, AY has one of the, uh, it has the biggest uh, comedy show in Africa right now. It, it, it never used to be so, you know. So, uh, I think we're doing well. And, uh, we're taking boys off the street, uh, so I think we're doing well as comedy people. I see a white here, principality of show business. <laughs> With the premier, you die quick. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can inherit your property. <laughs> if like you, they do the show, now people go back here. You go show us where you, they do the jasso. All of <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, Believe it or not, grace is different. You are seen as a gospel comedian, but some of your jokes are usually X-rated. What then are the values by which you operate? You must understand that if you say I'm a gospel comedian, you, you, I can't say you're wrong and I can't say you're right because I do not see myself as a gospel comedian. Uh, because when you say I'm a gospel comedian, you would have labelled me and put me to a corner. All right? It therefore means I can only perform in churches. You know, because there's nothing like really gospel comedian because we don't have gospel food or gospel cars or gospel house. We all live in houses, we eat food, you know. So, but if you say I'm a comedian who is a Christian, I will, I will, I will like that. But if you say I'm a gospel comedian, that is what I can't completely take in because I don't see myself as a just comedian who is called to perform to churches or to perform to gospel people. And because I'm a comedian, I have to please everybody if I have to. Because my being uh, a diversified comedian, I've been able to reach out to every race, tribe, and culture, beliefs, and everything. So uh, if you say some of my jokes are serious, I try as much as possible not to make it too vulgar, because if you put me in a club to perform, you don't expect me to tell Jesus' jokes, eh? because nobody will listen, all right? And uh, since I'm not an evangelist yet, I have to see a comedian, I got to do my job. And of course, you put me in a mosque, like, like I have been, you don't expect Jesus' jokes there because they will look at it very funny. The bottom line is, I'm there as a worker. I'm just like a Christian who works in the breweries. You know, so you can't say because I work in the breweries and then I'm alcoholic. You, it will not be right for you to say that. But you must also remember that uh, a man who cannot take off his household is worse than an infidel. And this is what I do, I'm not an engineer. I am a comedian. If I am a comedian, I have to do my job completely. I'm just like a gynecologist. I can't say because I'm a Christian and I'm a gynecologist and your wife comes to me and I will not do my job. I got to do my job. I don't care what I see. I got to do my job. Because once you're a gynecologist, any part of the woman you hold, you only do your job. That is how it works. So if you say uh, the jokes is a little bit X-rated, well, if that's how you perceive it, that's all right. But me, I don't see it that way. What I know I can do, I can tell a very sensitive joke and put a little twist on it and then use your brain to calculate the rest. That's what I try to do uh, so that it will look as if I'm a foul person. Uh, but in all, out of a hundred, if, if I've said one foul joke, it's not nothing wrong, man. I still have people who want to hear that. And because I'm doing my job properly, I got to do what I got to do. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but that's how it is. <laughs> I'm going to 
What can you say about comedians who copy the jokes of their colleagues? Absolutely, there's nothing wrong with a younger colleague cracking an, an older colleague's joke. There's nothing absolutely wrong. But everything is wrong when you continue in that. Every one of us started like that. I started off when I've, the little jokes I brought to Lagos, when I finished cracking them, I started taking little from basket, little from uh, uh, Alibaba, because I, I was yet to understand the industry. So I took a little bit of gandokis and all that, and then I now understood how it works. And then I went back to start creating my own jokes. All right, because you have the gift. It's, on, it's in the inside of you. When you put pressure on it, it will come out. But what I don't find funny is people who just base their career on cracking someone else's joke. Are you getting on the annoying part? You wouldn't even give credit to the person who created the joke. And now you go crack the joke where the original owner is not there, and then you blew the roof, and that same owner will not be invited to the same venue, and it's flat. And people will say it's not funny. As a matter of fact, life is not fair. That, that's how I see it. If life was fair, a particular soft drink should not be used as whiskey for long throat. They should use Agodai because that's a natural long throat someone whose neck is naturally long. But that's how it works. Life is never fair because even clients would not even check it out to know who is original. All they want to know, they laughed. And if they were, the boy was able to crack them up, they don't give a hoot who else comes to crack job. And it becomes very challenging for some of us who are already in the industry. You put more work on us. Now, if I have a new joke, I would rather hold it back, put it on my comedy CD, let it go out, and then I will be comfortable to say it. You know, even when someone has go to cry, you say, ah, Nagodos joke, I know him. I have been in Abuja before, just sitting in a lounge. A boy came and started cracking all my comedy city joke. And the crowd was like, hey, that's Godot joke. And the boy said, no, Godot actually took the joke from me. He said he took the joke, he said, because he's a big boy, he's a big comedian, now he's oppressing me. This that. I was shocked. And then somehow, when he finished fooling himself, he came over to sit close to me, not knowing I was there. As soon as he saw me, he just went down. So, God, I'm sorry. I told him, go backstage and correct that statement, or else I will go on stage myself and you will not like it. He went and said, uh, you know, uh, sometimes we just got to do our thing. My guy is here, God knows, and everything. The hall went wide, like seriously. And then I had to go on and said, well, you people should forgive this guy because he's, a, he's an upcoming comedian. And sometimes everybody got to make money with the situation of the country. You got to make money. And so, but I didn't take it to heart because I could relate to the fact that he's a young, younger comedian coming up. If you want to be a comedian, you got to be ready. Because the terrain is rough. I seen if you came in with just 10 jokes, you will run out in a month. You get to be spontaneous. You get to be creative. You know, so that's how I say. Some men, you be acting stupidly. That's why Helen Paul, with his fairy face. <laughs> Come here, they can't talk. Or, say, yes, I touch, I can, can. If you try that nonsense again, that will be the end of your career. <laughs> yeah, no, be jara, don't make me vest. I go talk. Oh. Will you encourage any of your kids to go into comedy? Well, lion cannot give birth to a goat. I won't be surprised if any of my children happen to be a comedian tomorrow. My father is very funny. My mother is funny. So here I am, a living joke. Um, so if, my, if any of my kids wants to do comedy, that's fine. Anything they want to do. Like I talk to them every morning. Anything you want to be in this life. Trust me, your father will support you. Because there's money in everything. So long it's not arm robbery, it's not prostitution. It's not drug dealing and have to do ritualistic things for you to do what you got to do. So long as this is your love and your passion, trust me, I will support you. But I've always wished that my kids would be in another field, not in entertainment. Having one entertainer in the family 
is already too much. It's the, 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 it's, we walk on the slippery ground here. I can't even begin to tell you everything. I know the pains I go through. I know the challenges I face as a comedian and as an entertainer. And I know the things my family suffers because I just have to make money. And so, but I'm not God. Destiny cannot be determined, can only be discovered. Wherever, wherever God wanted to be, I'm comfortable. You know, but if God should take that to next level, another field, I also give you thanks for it. To get human being where Juju to accept him, remove Mary Kay for her lipoff face. You don't see monkey when lick line. Before this frustrated wizard. Because when woman get my features, you call her he. Tell us one thing about you that nobody knows. I'm a very shy person. Very, very shy. When I'm not on stage, I'm Godwin, but when I'm on stage, I'm Godors. When I'm on stage, it's a different thing. You see, it's just pepper soup and water. They are both liquid, but you drink them differently. So I'm a very shy person. Uh, I can't say I'm God-fearing, but I love God, all right? And uh, you can see my heart, but I know I love God. When you go to a church and the pastor says, turn to your neighbor and say, shall be permanent. The good way you consider the condition of your neighbor, before you say it shall be permanent, hello? I try out for my church, don't know, say that cripple sit down near me, now they can say try and make a year. What projects are you currently working on? I have a lot of things I'm working on right now. My show is coming up in September. I was supposed to do it in May, but it didn't work out just because the hall was not ready. Uh, so I got to move it to September. I have to do a show, a stand-up show, just me, myself and I, you know, because uh, nowadays comedy shows, just you have like 20 comedians in one show and no time for them to express themselves. I don't feel too comfortable. I feel it is a trap, rather. But a comedian should be able to express himself, unleash. Once you have unleashed everything you've got, then you go back to refill, you know? But when you do have half half thing, I don't feel comfortable with it. So I want to be able to do a one-man show and just stand on stage and do my thing. Have freedom to express myself. Yes, I want to do that. Comedy Clinic World 7 will be out. Uh, these are the projects I'm working on. And I'm also working on uh, Godot's Comedy Community Service this year. And then I'm working on uh, uh, Discover Delta, which is a talent hunt uh, for the whole of uh, Delta, not Niger Delta, not Delta. So I'm, these are the projects I'm working on this year. Pastor said, do something crazy for the law because you wear guests, they roll, remove wig, they tie each other face. Yeah? The pastor moved up and said, do something crazier because you wear people, they slap each other for job. Me, I withdraw. As soon as the pastor said, do something the craziest. One worry boy just come out for back of church, come front, carry church offering, night the church. What is your philosophy of life? Humility plus the fear of God is equal to honor, life, and wealth. That's my philosophy. In everything you do, you must be humble. You must know we really don't have great people. People we have are those who are enjoying the grace of God. So whatever that you've been blessed by, know that it's for a season. I've not seen the, the richest man on earth who died and went with everything. You must not forget that humility plus the fear of God is equal to honor, it's equal to life, and equal to riches. That's my philosophy.